I love gathering with you every single morning to dive deep into God's Word together and just to share what's on my heart with you. And I hope just to stir inside of your heart just a newfound desire for the Word of God. You know, we hold this Bible in our hands. And sometimes I think maybe we forget that this is God's love letter to us. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, let's just think about it today. Let's just say today you got a letter from, I don't know, the President of the United States. Okay, and, and you've got that letter in your hands. What are you going to do? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to call someone on the phone. And you're going to say, I've got a letter from the President of the United States. And you wouldn't believe what it says. And you're going to tell everybody, and you're going to show everybody this letter from the president. Why? Because it's not a natural thing for us to get a letter from the president of the United States. Well, friends, let me tell you something. We hold something even greater in our hands. We hold God's love letter to us. And so why don't we share it with others, number one? Why don't we read it? For ourselves, why don't we ponder over it? Why don't we go back and reread it over and over and over again to see what God has to say to us? You know, I, I remember when I first went into ministry, I can remember my father saying to me once, I told him, I said, Daddy, I just worry sometimes. You know, I worry that maybe I'm going to run out of things to preach. Maybe I'm going to run out of things to say. And I remember my daddy saying to me, Zach, you can always preach Jesus. And that's absolutely true. We can always preach Jesus. And here's the thing, friends. I have been, I have been a pastor now for 11 years preaching this book, studying this book. And I will tell you there's not a day that goes by that I don't pick it up, that I don't read a text that I've read before, but I pick up something new in it. But then also, there's not a day that goes by that I'm not overwhelmed and overcome by just how, just how profound and magnificent this word is and recognize I will never exhaust it. When you think you understand, you recognize how little you understand. This is God's word, so dive deep into it in your daily walk with Christ. Now, this week, this week I want us to turn to 1 Corinthians 15. This is going to cover the majority of our week this week. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, to me, is the most important and the most imperative chapter written by the hand of the Apostle Paul. For it is a defense of the resurrection of Jesus and of our future resurrection as believers. So this is a defense of the resurrection of Jesus. Can I just remind you, friends, that the resurrection of Jesus is the message that causes Christianity to stand apart from every other religion on earth. Just this past weekend, I was down in Clarkston, Georgia, uh, just right outside of Atlanta. This is called the most diverse city in America. In just a 1.7 mile radius, there are 50 people groups a hundred or 50 different countries represented, 120 languages, and 300 people groups in this one little 1.7 mile radius city. And while I was there, I met people from Iraq and Chad and Uganda, uh, not Uganda, um, uh, Congo and Burma and Myanmar, all in just a one hour time frame, all these people that I'm meeting. While I was standing there, this young man comes by, he's 15 years old, and he's a Muslim man. And I just began to talk to him and speak with him about his uh, religion, being uh, Muslim. And so I just asked him the question. And I'll be honest, I, I kind of played the fool, you know. I kind of played like I didn't know, it, even though I've studied a lot on the, the, the religion of Islam and know a lot about it. I just kind of played the fool and just said, hey man, tell me about your religion. I don't know too much. And so he begins to explain, and I started to ask questions about his prayer life and about how he gets to uh, heaven, and he just began to share with me, he prays five times a day, and uh, that, that it's his good deeds that are going to get him to heaven. If his good deeds outweigh his bad deeds, that's how he's going to get there. And I began to share with him, it's not what we can do, it's by faith, and just showing him the difference between Christianity and Islam, and back and forth we went. We had been talking for 
probably 20 minutes or so. And he said, hey, look, I've got to go. And he, he ran off. And I just went on about my day doing what I was doing. Well, probably in half an hour later, he came back. He walked right up to me. He said, uh, let's continue to talk. And so I just kept talking with him and sharing with him. And as we shared together, um, I looked at him and I asked him the following question. I said, if you wanted right now to go and visit Muhammad, where would you go and visit his body? And this young man looked back at me in his African accent. And he said, well, I would go and visit him in the grave. And I said, yes, right. You would absolutely, you would go visit him at the grave. You would go to his tomb in order to view his body. I said, now let me ask you this question. If you wanted to see Jesus, if you wanted to visit him, where would you visit him today? And he said, well, I would go to his grave. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, Jesus is not in the grave. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. Now, now friends, listen to me. When I said that, this young Muslim man, he kind of cocked his head to the side and looked almost surprised as if he had never heard of the resurrection, which reminds us that there are people all around us who do not know the message of Jesus. And so he kind of looked at me funny and I said, listen, man, Jesus overcome the grave. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. And if you go right now to Jerusalem, you can visit his grave, but he's not there. He is risen and he is in heaven physically at the right hand of God. And he's coming back to judge the earth. And here I'm standing with this young man as he's looking at me. And I said, now let me ask you a question. You say your religion says that Mu that Muhammad is the greatest of all prophets, and that Jesus is just one of the prophets. He said, yes. And I said, but now let me ask you this. If you could go today and visit the grave of Muhammad, and his body is there, but you could also go to the grave of Jesus, and his body's not there because he resurrected. So Muhammad's dead, but Jesus overcome the grave. Which prophet, in your mind, I say he's the son of God, Jesus, but which one is greater, Muhammad or Jesus? He paused. They refused to answer the question. I said, which one is greater? One is still dead. One overcome the grave. Which one is greater? And he looked back at me and he, he just kind of shrugged his shoulders. I said, okay, let me put it to you this way. If me and you both die, I stay dead, but you rise. Which one of us is greater? He said, me. And I said, so then Jesus is greater than Muhammad? And he said, yes. True story. Right there, standing in that parking lot, he and I talked about Faith in the Lord Jesus. Now that young man has not given his heart to Christ today, but it's my hope that the seed that I planted in his heart might come to grow one day and bear fruit. But that is an amazing story, isn't it, friends? The resurrection. It's the resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection. That should always be on our lips. Jesus died, yes, we preach Christ and him crucified, but let's not leave Jesus on the cross. On the cross, Jesus suffered the punishment we deserve. Jesus bore the wrath of God in our place and died for our sins. But what does the Bible say? The wages of sin is what? Death. Death is the wage of sin. So the only way that Jesus can prove that his sacrifice on the cross was actually sufficient to pay for our sins is what? To rise from the dead, because in rising from the dead, he proves that he actually paid the price, the rage, the ransom for our sin. And so the resurrection becomes essential to the faith, which is exactly what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, now in verse 12, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is without foundation. And so is your faith. In addition, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified about God that he raised up Christ and we did not raise up if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Therefore, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. Friends, Christ has been raised. And in that, we can rejoice. Our sins as believers in Christ have truly 
been forgiven. God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow on New Horizons.